This is the Focus on Parliament show on Civic Space TV brought to you by the Center for Constitutional Governance. I am Isaac Kwagala, your host. It is often said that taxes are the lifeblood of any sound political economy. Well, in Uganda, questions abound as to the commitment of the government to prudently utilize the revenue resources of the country to provide effective service delivery to the citizens. This as the government proposes new tax amendments. Well, on this program, we discuss the state of the Ugandan economy with a, spe a specific emphasis on the tax regime and the proposed new budget for the financial year 2025-2026. Viewers, you're most welcome to the program. I now have the pleasure and the honor to introduce my guests to you. Starting from my immediate left is Dr. Sarah Birete, yes. the Executive Director for the Center for Constitutional Governance. You're most welcome to the program, Doctor. Thank, thank you. I'm glad to be on the show. Good morning, viewers and listeners. Thank you for joining us. Mm. Next to Doctor is Mr. Joseph Tahinduka. He's an analyst working with the Center for Policy Analysis. You're most welcome to the program, Joseph. Uh, th thank you, my brother. We look forward to uh, breaking this monster down. Uh, maybe by the time we're done with the show, we'll have known whether this monster can be managed by the Ugandan state. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and Charity Ahimbisiwe, the Executive Director for the Electrolaws and, and Governance Institute. Charity, you're most welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Isaac. A very good morning to everyone, and uh, happy to be here after mm. an interesting week. Interesting. Mm. What did you particularly find interesting uh, in the uh, week? Uh, uh, every day is a news day in Uganda. Things change <laughs> at a sporadic rate. Mm. I don't know if you know that even as we sit here, something may happen. Breaking. And uh, once it breaks out, haven't you seen everybody in Kabaka's palace? Mm. Money. Mm. This morning somebody took 50 million. Yesterday his son took 25 million. 20. Hey, kid out. If a good cause though, we suppose. <laughs> now I'm telling you, you said hey. you, what is happening. I told you news is happening everywhere. It's now inside the Kamakas Palace. Mm. Mm. Okay. Doctor, let me start with you. Mm. It is Sir Winston Churchill, the famous former British Prime Minister, who remarked that. Uh, there is no such thing as a nation taxing itself into prosperity. But for the Ugandan case, we are quite amused, I should say, by the government's position to introduce new taxes, even on things that pertain to the day-to-day uh, -day living of the common man. We've seen new taxes levied on, uh, according to the proposals tabled in Parliament, mm -hmm. on kerosene, on fuel, on cement, on mineral water, even on uh, land transactions, what have you got to say about this? Well, with our hungry, you know, government with the insatiable greed because of endemic corruption, if it were possible, I think they would tax the oxygen we consume. So coming from that background, I want to refer viewers to the canons of taxation. They can, there are seven principles or canons of taxation. And key among them is a the principle of equity. Equity meaning that taxes should be fair, should be just, should be equitable, where everybody pays a fair share, but should also take consideration of the indigent or vulnerable population that should then be untaxed to have leverage to cope with the day-to-day -day costs of living. The other principles include convenience, taking into consideration the status of the economy or earnings of the people, flexibility, simplicity in terms of collection and others. But I want to dwell more as a human rights defender on the principle of equity. When you look at the bulk of taxes in this country, they don't favor the poor. They instead favor 
the rich because more than 70% of our taxes are indirect, meaning that whatever you consume, you pay tax. I want to take an example. And these taxes go to the smaller items, including salt. Everybody consumes salt. Mm. So when you say that the rich and the poor pay the same tax on salt, where is the fair share principle? When you levy a tax on paraffin, who are the people consuming paraffin? The poorest, the wretched of the earth. People who still use the mm. the the local made candles. You put a levy of 500 on this poor person who cannot even afford a candle. I don't even know the cost of a candle because I don't use them, I'm sorry. 500. Yes. It now, <laughs> these people cannot afford. Mm. They cannot afford a lamp. How much is a lamp? They consume paraffin in the Tadova to just have a little light as they go to sleep. There are so many households that have to have supper before dark because they don't have any means of lighting in their houses. Now, once in a while, when they buy paraffin for their small lighting, you are putting a tax on them. What is their income? Use the money we pay the old as a baseline. We pay the old about 30000 a month. The what? The elders. The, the elders. They pay 30. Yes, 30000 mm -hmm. a month. Mm -hmm. yes. Stay paid. Yes. Mm. If you went to the market today, what can you buy with 30000 those are five kilos of kosher. Mm, two kilos of meat. Or two kilos of meat. Mm. Mm. Kilo or six kilos, kilos of beans. Mm. And this is a, a, the whole income that a family, a household, led by the elderly, spend on a whole month. Personally, I can't use 30,000 even in a day. Mm. At home for grocery? Whether I'm at home, whether I'm at work, like it's not enough for mm. the day. Mm. That, that's what I'm saying. So how do we, you then, tax the <laughs> other people? Th that's the 30,000 you are taxing as they buy paraffin. Let's lift the bed high and go to cement. For each of the 50 kilograms of cement, we are adding about 500, about 500 shillings. So the business people will divide this money to the cost of cement. Cement for the end consumer. Yes, mm. the consumer will bear the price. Because mm. it's usually, it's always the consumer mm. who pays the tax. Mm. It's not the middlemen or the business people. So what are you doing to the construction? We have schools which are collapsing. It's just the beginning of rainy season. We have schools that are collapsing. We have been seeing documentaries of schools in the, in the part of West Nile, where a whole school, all seven classrooms study in one room. Will this tax enable or encourage such people to construct a second classroom? You have seven classes, P1 to P7, in one room, studying in one room. What does the tax on cement mean to them? Why don't you then say that you will tax the rich? Maybe say if you buy. I don't know how it can even be levied. But in progressive taxation, you should tax people according to their sources of income, mm. exempting the vulnerable. That's what progressive tax does. Let's go to the tax on fuel. Who will feel the heaviest pinch? Because we have added 1,550 shillings per Little of Little. fuel. Mm. Who will pay the heaviest burden? Bear the, the heaviest burden is always borne by people with lower income. Because this is nothing to the rich. This doesn't mean anything. The rich never check fuel or pump prices. It's us, the struggling middle income, that go to the pump price. Then you find you are driving to the next because of 100 shilling difference. Rich people never do such things. Mm. So the, the biggest bearer of this tax are the people who use public transport. Because the tax person, the, the, the taxes are going to take advantage. 
But doctor, let me briefly pick your comment on the proposed levy on the mineral water. I'm coming to that. No, let me first finish fuel. Okay. Because fuel mm. has a multiplier effect on every other service. Mm. So when you increase fuel cost, the tax people are going to increase this money per liter on every passenger. They will not even say we are dividing. Or even more. Yes. Mm. So the transport is going to increase by 1,000 or 2,000 per station. And what are people using uh, uh, public transport? One engine. They're struggling working class. So you will reach a stage, there's an increment of 1,000 per head because of this increment that you're charging mm. on a liter of fuel that will skyrocket pump prices. And the people, the people who will pay the highest burden of fuel, of fuel are the people who use public transport, not people driving their own cars. When you look at the cost of food, it's going to increase because food is transported from the garden to the market and there's a fuel cost. So people are going to skyrocket the cost of food prices, hence inflation in the country because everybody buys food. So that's the impact, or the deeper impact of taxes. When it comes to mineral water, you are pushing people to drink dirty water. Because if I, everybody's going to be pushed to drink, boil and drink their own water. We have water bottles. In this healthy lifestyle living, everybody has a water bottle. Whether they move with it or not is another issue. I'm sure each one of us here uh, uh. has a water bottle. All our children have water bottles at school. So either you are pushing people, clean and drink their own water because it is easier and cheaper in the long run and move with their water bottles but also you're pushing the people now who don't have the means to boil and clean their own water to drink and boiled water hence dysentery cholera for the people in slums and arrest and that is a heavier burden on the economy when the people are falling sick all the time they will not work they will not be productive but you're also spending more in the health sector. There is also the other tax on real, real estate that, mm. is, that is double in a way because already there is a there capital is gains mm. tax. Mm. There is also a fee when you are trans transferring property. But now there is an additional mm. tax. So what does that mean that you are increasing taxes on the same category of people? So the tax is not spread. Mm. Those are my quick submissions. So there is also another one on the agents banking transactions. I don't know uh, what your view summarily is on that. What the it will kick out the... people. We are working, on the other hand, under PDM, we are working on inclusion into the money economy. Mm. We have 38% of the people outside the money economy. As, right. yes, as we push for inclusion, we are putting a levy that will continue to push away people from the money economy. Mm. So that's the impact. Joseph, from the government standpoint, I want to suppose the justification is the government wants to expand uh, its revenue based collection so that it is in a position to meet the ever growing need by the citizens to have uh, services effectively delivered to them. But it begs the question <coughs> how is the government supposed to realize uh, those aims? without increasing uh, the tax base. Because for them, their reasoning is this is a way, a means of achieving that target. Let us expand the target base so that in turn, we have more money to spend on these priorities which the citizens need. Uh, what are your views on this? Uh, thank you. I think that's a very, very good question. So it, at the end, government wants to ensure it has more taxes coming in, in such that they can deliver more social services. And then they are now having this excise amendment bill, having this income, and income uh, tax amendment bill, and all these taxes. But I think that also begs the question of, OK, you want to have this one trillion added, and you make the standard of living worse at the expense of you just expanding by one trillion. How about? you do what exactly you said you are going to do. You implement the fiscal consolidation policies where you're reducing the bloated expenditure that you're having as a government system 
waste food expenditure such that those resources can be redirected to social services, such that you are able to focus the resources that you have on activities which then generate resources. So at its core, we need to understand that the government is just looking for more money to waste. That's, that's pretty much it. Because let's be realistic, a lot of money is wasted in so many things. Look at the, the events that the state has where we are spending like let's go to like the EC budget which is proposed. Five hundred million on praying for the next election. Let's look at all those travel expenditures <laughs> which uh, Honorable Samuel Junganda was talking about that uh, maybe I'd go into Saudi Arabia or, or something. There we could actually save trillions of shillings from us knowing that we are a poor country and our budget is already limited and therefore we just need to live within our own budget. But let's say the URA corrects that money. Okay, can we accurately say that that money is fundamentally going to create this specific effect? No. Which essentially means that we need to look within and understand that we are addicted to spending the money that we do not have. And as a result, we are squeezing the 1% who already don't have money. I understand Dr. has said that the rich need to be taxed more. And I agree, they need to pay their fair share of taxes. But then we're overtaxing them already. They are bearing the burden of over 40 million Ugandans themselves, which essentially means that we have a problem, and that problem cannot be fixed by us just taxing, uh, just taxing those rich people who are then going to have what uh, uh, the good doctor has said, uh, uh, a ripple effect on the citizens. because. You will tax their businesses, their fuel stations, their fuel import businesses, and then they're going to rip it over to the ordinary citizen. So let's fix the problem. We are addicted to spending. We need to check our addiction such that we, that money that we are wasting in things that are not germane to the interests of Uganda can then be rewired to the provision of social services of the Ugandan state. Yeah, that, that's where I start. Charity, uh, Joseph says that we seem to suffer an addiction for spending as a country. But the government, through the principal private secretary to the Treasury last week, argued that they seem to uh, face a tough balancing act in a sense that the new proposals to expand the tax base are aimed at putting in place a strategy to bolster the revenue uh, of the country so that progressively they can begin to reduce on the foreign debt threshold and then have the local uh, taxes, the collections fund, the budget and also uh, I think in a way uh, begin to meet the ever-growing uh, social service delivery needs of the population but I want to ask what's your evaluation of these new tax proposals? The new tax proposals in view of what kind of population do you have. So the quality of population that we have is largely a poverty population. You have a very small number of people who are wealthy, majority are poor. And you just had Luasa, he's one of the rich men from Masaka. He has been crying, President Museven, help me, my pockets have run dry. Everyone whose pocket runs dry cries. President Museven rescue me of all those rich men. Are they actually rich or are they also living a, a, a certain life of a fallacy? Do they really have money in those pockets? Are those investments real or a facade? We need to think about those things if we are going to analyze this budget altogether. Uh, we also need to think about the question of agriculture. Every time the president comes and says, you know, for me now, I want people who go into agriculture with the Chivalo. Eh? Mm -hmm. This is his latest talk. And he's always uh, parading the farmers who have benefited. These ones, I gave cows. These ones, I gave pigs. These ones, I gave goats. These ones. How many Ugandans depend on agriculture? Over 80%. These are statistics from you, boss. So is that model of his going to work? the one of where he gives to certain farmers, they have benefited, they have said, okay, yes, for us we have changed. How many more people have they changed? 
For me, I would have expected that, yes, he gave a certain group of people. Let's say he gave a hundred. And a hundred have been able to transform, each farmer has been able to transform a hundred others. So if a hundred each transformed a hundred, then we multiply by a hundred. Then you're doing something. But if you're only influencing a hundred, and it is the hundred that you will keep parading every time that you have modeled, and they are good farmers, and they have money, their household income has gone up, then what ultimately are you saying to the rest of the 38 million Ugandans, or 42 million, you have a, a census that is coming to tell us whether you're still 42 or more than that. What are you saying to the rest of the people? So, in view of what has been suggested, I know for a fact that government has been defending its position, one, on paraffin. They said they are discouraging the use of paraffin. paraffin. They want people to use LPG, which is gas for cooking. And they said that uh, they have gas cylinders they've been giving out to the houses. The question I ask again, how many people, even us who are stayed here, how many of us received gas from government? I doubt if any of us has a gas cylinder from the government. Now, if us, who are not up, not down, we are just there, ordinary citizens. You are the middle class, the much the one, the middle class. Uh, the ones that... <laughs> middle you know, income uh, status. Lower middle. Yeah, middle. middle. I don't know whether we are even <laughs> not middle class. We are hustlers. <laughs> <laughs> you are hustlers. That's a right right one. Right, that's the right one. Because, right. because uh, right. ultimately, if we do not have them, are the ordinary people having those cylinders? I'm hearing that for the person. And will they refill them? No, the Ministry of Energy said they have supplied mm. and they are continuing to supply oh. cylinders to households to use gas for cooking. Then how about and, lighting? Uh, lighting, they talk of rural electrification, electrification and they are saying they are going to continue to upscale it. But it is still at 32% for the last 15 years. So why hasn't it changed? What has failed? What needs to be done? So if you're telling us that, so okay, fine, you're taxing to improve services, first show us the services that you've improved. Because before you improve them and then you're increasing the taxes, then it doesn't make sense for us. I don't know if you read that you are a report, the one that uh, has been trending, of how many people are now able to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a, a particular number of people on the list Mm. And that number slumped down to mm. only 20. 20 companies from 100. Now, that tells you something. The businesses business. are closing. The big businesses which were also paying those taxes can now no longer manage to pay mm. because the environment is harsh. Banks are closing because they don't have the minimum amount that is required by Bank of Uganda to continue operating as a bank. Now, if you see banks which had registered to be banks now becoming microfinances, you understand that the economic environment is harsh. So as a government, what would be more frugal at this point? It is to make the environment more healthy for businessmen, more healthy for banks to operate, more healthy for that money economy people that you're talking about. See how to improve their daily household income. The farmers that the president likes to put his thrust on, can he now task them to also cause a ripple effect? So we know from one farmer, we can hear a whole train of 100 farmers behind that one farmer. If they are not worth building more farmers and they are just going to benefit by them having good houses, having good cows, and having the four model plan on their acres of land which he gave them, then it's not worthwhile for us as a country. Because ideally, every Ugandan should be able to benefit mm. from uh, uh, the economy. Doctor, let us revisit the famous words of Sir Winston Churchill. If a nation cannot tax itself into prosperity, uh, now, of course, evaluating the Ugandan context, what can the government practically do to ensure that it achieves the double aim of uh, ensuring sufficient revenue collection to meet the ever-growing service delivery for the citizens, but also to ensure that the citizens are full and inclusive participants of the economy? 
Let is me, it a conundrum? Yeah, let me first start by building on the point Charity made on the shrinking tax base in the country. Mm. And I have the data here. Mm. From your Out of the 100 billion and above category, mm. we have a decline from 125 taxpayers to six. You see? Mm. This is a, a 90, 95% decline. Yes, mm. because 100 to six. six. Then from the 50 billion to 100 billion, you have 130, and you have declined to three. Mm. This is a 97% decline. Wow. From 10 billion to 50 billion, you are declining from 871 to 63. Eight hundred. Still substantial. 95% decline. From 5 billion to 10 billion, 711 to 58, 91% decline. These are the big taxpayers in the country. All of them above 90% decline. Mm. I know that URA has realized uh, slightly above. A surplus of about 1 trillion? Yeah, mm. 0. That's what I said. 0. 0.23%, mm. yeah, from the projected revenues. To, to above by 0 0.23, we congratulate them. Mm. But at what cost? Because this data, the same data, shows that businesses are closing. Mm. We have had the World Bank, the last two weeks, downgraded three banks. Yes. From banking institutions yes. to microfinance, mm. deposit-taking institutions. Mm. That is a big decline in the economy. So as much as URA is milking the citizens and realizing taxes in terms of collections, mm. we need to look at the health of the economy through the citizens. Mm. Are citizens thriving? Are citizens not thriving? So can we tax ourselves to prosperity, going by Churchill's words? Mm. You need to build a foundation before you tax the economy too prosperity and what are the foundations of the of the economy foundations of the economy are mainly found in four sectors the first sector is infrastructure look at the state of roads in the in the, in the country you drive every day the next day you spend it in a garage so you the economy the money that people would be reinvesting in their <coughs> businesses has all shifted to consumption through garage costs. Maybe on that point, it's important to point out that the infrastructure, especially the roads, I think account for the second highest percentage of the budget after defense. Even it has always been like that. Mm. But how did we get to the state where we are? The money is stolen and I'm coming with corruption. Roads have always had a lion share in the budget. But what is the state of the roads? <laughs> Nothing. Mm. So when you look at the second issue in terms of infrastructure, is the time we lose in traffic jam. Every person, either you wake up so early to beat traffic jam, meaning that you are affecting your health gradually, or you will lose two hours in the morning in traffic jam and two hours in the evening in traffic jam, and that's the minimum. At times we spend three, four hours going home, depending on where you stay. So the time lost in traffic jam in Uganda is a lot of money that would add to the productivity of a nation. Why can't we create an infrastructure that solves the traffic jam dilemma the way Nairobi has done? Nairobi used to have traffic jam from the airport in the morning. Mm. If you take an early morning flight, which I used to do when I was still young, you will lose traffic three hours. You will spend three hours <laughs> connecting to a meeting room. But as we talk today, from the airport, Jomo Kenyatta International Airport in Nairobi, is that three hours, 30 minutes to drive at most? 20 to 30 minutes to drive, to you, are, you are at your yes, CBD and you are at your destination. At times it's 10 minutes. So why can't we have an infrastructure that clears traffic jam in the city? So what's the impediment for that, doctor? Thinking, the mindset of the leaders. I mean, who are the planners of this country? They are not planning. <coughs> and we have them and we pay them. Starting from National Planning Authority, plus every government entity has a planner. What are they doing? What is the Ministry of Transport doing 
Do they get stuck in the jam? Can we quantify the time lost in traffic jam in Kamba? It's a lot of money. Yeah. So the second issue that can jumpstart an economy is education and health. Uh, let me combine two and three, education and health. Uh -huh. The health of a citizen and the skills, the skilling of a citizen uh -huh. has a lot of value addition, a lot of multiplier effect on the productivity of the economy. So once you build the quality of a citizen, that is the citizen now that Churchill was talking about, mm -hmm. that you can tax into productivity, but you do not tax. You go to the village and tax somebody who has never seen a blackboard into productivity. What is there to tax? They are either working in a stone quarry, they are either laying bricks. Mm -hmm. What are you going to tax into productivity once you have not skilled that human resource? So the fourth issue is fiscal discipline in the country. The, our leaders like talking about frugality as a slogan when they do the reverse. Mm -hmm. They are proposing to have the, the president, the parliament. The president, you wait for the state of nation address. Frugality, de, 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 de. <laughs> but he spends three billion every day. Three billion every day. Is that frugality? What does he consume? Compare with the developed countries. Yesterday I did share a, a, a video where Michelle Obama was explaining that everything in the White House that they consumed is paid for mm -hmm. by the president. But you look at our state, three billion every day, and you go preaching to citizens to be frugal. What a madness is that? Mm. I have nothing mm. to add. Mm. Uh, Joseph will help us here. Joseph, <laughs> as, uh, I trust me, I'm not going to do that. But I'll say that. <laughs> I, I'm not Jesus. I might, I no, that. but as a concerned citizen, certainly, sure. uh, I know you could have some ideas uh, in terms of the solutions that we could apply to practically alleviate the situation or even solve it all together. So, we want to understand how can the government be able to. Uh, you know, jumpstart the economy out of this crisis. Because, like I said earlier, they justified the new tax proposals as trying to play a tough balancing act. We want to sustain the economy on its toes, but also we need to meet uh, the ever-growing needs of the citizens. Social services, education, health, uh, the road infrastructure that doctor is making reference to. So. Going forward, because we now see the, much of the disappointment and frustration from the citizens is that the taxes they pay are not commensurate with the level of service delivery that they see on the ground. How do we get out of this, practically? Um, <clears throat> I think it's important uh, to appreciate the, the nature of African societies. African societies chose to become states at, the, at independence not because there were states before, but because uh, there was colonial will for different tribes to be in one political boundary and then uh, adopt what they call a social contract. In many, in many cases, we tend to think that it's, it's a given. And as a result, uh, as, as a result there's, it's, it's strong. So, in nations, for example, which are built on just one tribe, say the British or, 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 any, or the Russians, there's like one national solidarity, even the Rwandans, there's one national solidarity to build a state. So you are seeing every citizen trying to make their singular contribution to make sure this state works. In colonial uh, states that were built by, by, by the colonial empire, we see a different concept. Everyone who takes up political leadership seems to want to take from the state rather than give to it. That applies both to uh, citizens, that applies to politicians. So it becomes a political culture where if I am a Muganda and I occupy a political office, I want to suck everything to my micro state, which is the Uganda. Same thing with Museven to accumulate power. So it's more or less like kingdoms subsided 
But at its core, at the top, there is still some level of individualism that is sucking it up. So the idea of being a states person is not strong. The social contract is too artificial. When you ask a Ugandan, what does it mean to be a Ugandan? They, they don't understand it. Most of what they really say is the government should do X, should do Y. But at its core, on what contribution they should be making at its core, they, they, they don't particularly see it. And that is going to take me to my uh, second analysis. If we really expect that the state is going to be built up by politicians, then we are in for a very long ride, a very, very bad one. I don't know any state on planet Earth which you can point to uh, their overall development to the, a fundamental role that uh, the leadership played. And I can take you through different states. Let's go to America. If you watch like, a documentary of the men who built America, uh, uh, John D. Rockefeller and, and the others. These are citizens who said, okay, things are tough, but we're going to build this state nevertheless. And these citizens accumulate power to the extent that they can even influence the political outcome on how that state is, should be managed. Such that citizens are empowered to such a level to which they cannot tolerate what, for example, a good doctor has said, a president who is spending is it, is three, billion. three billion every day, every day. in a poor country. I, I don't know what name they gave it recently, a road maybe the income country. Then the, the second example would be, you know, you, the government is very good at uh, uh, preaching uh, uh, water and, and drinking wine. Recently, they introduced, uh, I think, around 20 rationalization bills. Mm -hmm. We all know they spend three billion, right? They meet every Monday as a cabinet. The nature of the rationalization bills which came into parliament could only tell one story. Rationalization for the viewers is where they are trying to reduce government expenditure, reduce duplication in government agencies, ensure that the state can remain a tiny force which is effective rather than a very, very huge wide force that is not delivering. The nature of bills which came to Parliament without impact assessments, without feasibility on exactly how they are going to move forward, and which were kicked out. You look through the bill structure of Parliament, almost, almost three quarters of them were pulled out. It shows government was simply paying a lip service to this. They were simply saying, okay, let's posture as if we are doing something, but yet we are not doing something. And later on, of course, the, the, the rhetoric would be that uh, we, we introduced it, you people rejected it. For someone who has a budget of, you said, two billion per day, you three. can't three. Yes. You can't say you can't fail to produce clear bills with impact assessments. You have an entire force of a research team. You can even hire from anywhere, whether it is KPMG or Price Water Coopers. Like you have resources that you can deploy within and without. So it shows you that it's important for us to recognize that as citizens, our individual agency to contribute to the nation must be at the core of development. For us to trust leaders who we are going to uh, employ uh, uh, the, 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 the most brutal military tactics to make sure they remain in power to, to, for people who are just going to remain just consuming the resources we give them, and we are putting hope in, in, in such hyenas who are just fisting over the meat. It's, it's a bit myopic. As citizens, we need to know we, are, we need to build this country. That involves us really taking up our own citizen agency and voting out those that are not delivering on the promises. That means building a critical mass of citizens who require accountability from those that they vote. That requires citizens who wake up every day and say things are bad. But I'm going to do my part. But otherwise, if we are to leave it to the political state, like I said at the beginning, we're in for a very, very long ride. Thank you. Focus on Parliament now takes a short break. When we return, we continue the discussion on the general state of the Ugandan economy with a special focus on the 2025-2026 budget proposals. See you shortly. 
Digital rights are those human rights and legal rights that allow individuals to access, use, create and publish digital media or to access and use computers, other electronic devices and telecommunication networks. Digital rights include a right to freedom of expression, information and communication through technology, a right to privacy and data protection, a right to credit for personal works, a right to universal and equal digital access, a right to identity, a right to anonymity, a right to be forgotten and a right for protection of minors among others. The state's digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak out or report to the responsible parties when one's rights are violated. Welcome back. This is the Focus on Parliament show on Civic Space TV. In this segment, we examine the budgetary proposals for the year 2024-2025. I want to start with you, Charity. Let us examine the priorities of the government in the financial year 2024-2025 for the reason that uh, we saw in the week ending uh, a team from the Electoral Commission headed by the chairperson defending their budgetary estimates indicating that they want up to a tune of 1.1 trillion to conduct the 2026 general elections. And one of the items was to conduct mass prayers for uh, the elections, which they have estimated to a tune of 500 million. Then there is another strange phenomenon <laughs> in the budget where they project to hire lawyers up to a tune of 18 billion for <laughs> an election they anticipate. Uh, where does this leave the nation if you are to juxtapose it with the other, you know, critical areas of the budget like the social services, the health, the education, or even the infrastructure because as we know it's a key enabler for economic development. Are the priorities of the government well aligned? So they are not well aligned and I think what government needs to do is to first look at that budget a bit critically and cut back on most of the costs that they are propping up for citizens. But uh, one of the priority areas that I think I want to dwell on a bit, and it's going to affect a mass a group of people, is real estate. Government has said there's going to be a 5% tax on any land you sell in a city or municipal. Of course, the Electoral Commission and their wish list of 1.1 1 .1 trillion and lying to us, thinking we've never done elections in this country and don't know about petitions, going to court and telling us this is the money that they need to pay lawyers, and lawyers have come out and said this is a hoax. The lawyers themselves who are hired have said this is a hoax, you can't inflate our budget to this extent. So government had better think back on what the lawyers are saying and what's the inflation that is coming from Electoral Commission. I don't want to dwell on losers they better think of better ways of spending money than tell Ugandans total lies. So for Electoral Commission and their national prayers, which prayers are they even doing about elections? Elections don't need prayers. So that elections, you elections, elections need quality processes to deliver quality results. That's it, not prayers. Why should you be praying? Who are you going to waste time for that you're praying? You're praying to God to do what? To come down from the sky and manage the election when you're blocking observers from observing elections. So, Electoral Commission, for that one, I don't even want to comment. That is a wasted journey. Let me go to this journey of where I think I need to focus government. If they want to touch Electoral Commission, they will touch them. If they don't want, let them keep them and they conduct the national prayers and we'll see if they will change anything on the electoral spectrum. In my view, it will not change anything. Now, the real estate. Today, I saw a man in Nansana saying, I have my house for sale, it is 350 million. Now, 350 million is sitting on an acre, half an acre. And it says, you bring the money. If you're going to sell a house in Nansana now, you'll pay 
of tax on the 350 million that you will earn. Remember that even if that land was inherited from your father, you're still going to pay that tax. Before now, you are not going to pay money, a, a tax over land that you had inherited. But with this new tax regime, what it means, even inherited land, you're going to pay a tax. If you look at your savings clubs, these ones that you keep talking about, this circle in this village, this circle in this one, this, all those circles buy land and sell land to make savings that they keep for the members. That is the thing that they've been involved in, real estate. Now, with your introduction of the taxes, all those savings are going to be wiped out like this. Oop. Which means all those people who have been boasting how they have jobs in circles, they're also going down. If they remain, it's going to be a very difficult thing to manage even ordinary circles. The whole of Mbarara is running on circles. If you come to Kampala, these small, medium enterprise employees go to New Vision, go to Monitor. All these people manage to drive or even have small money to keep around because of circles. You save at the end of every month 200,000. But now if you're going to save money which is not going to accumulate for you, like what you saved is what you will get. You will get no interest on that money. Then what are you doing? Because that is what the real estate tax is going to do to circles and real estate market. You cannot sell your rented house like you had rentals. You're selling them. If you're going to sell rentals, 5% tax you have to pay to the government. Now, 5% is too high a tax. Even if government wanted to tax this, why didn't they go for 1%? Why 5%? Let me even make it more ridiculous. What government has done is more ridiculous. If you have shares in a private company, and you want to sell those shares, you're going to pay 5% tax for shares which you owned and you've just decided to sell them. Who is going to sell shares? Charity, can I add something on real estate? Yes. So even if you're selling your property to go for treatment, you'll pay tax. Yes. Mm. Even if you're selling your property to pay fees, you'll pay tax. Yes. So it's not that those people who are benefiting trading from it, yes, in trading real estate, in it, yes. Ordinarily, those are the people who should pay tax Correct. because they are making a profit. So government should tax profit or yes. business that results into profit, not like people selling to go to India for kidney transport. So you will first pay tax before you go and do your transport, whether you die or not, that's your business. Exactly. Uh. So the situation is dire. This is the one area that government needs to change. It needs to drop that tax as immediate as yesterday, equal to the one that they wanted to introduce for us when we were going to withdraw money at the ATMs. You know, they wanted to introduce a tax at the ATM. Now, that tax was going to be triple taxation. You've already paid pay as you earn. You've already sent your NSSF, remitted it, and then your money is being sent to the bank without those two. And you're picking it from the bank and you have another tax you are going to pay for receiving it from the ATM. Ugandans rejected. And I am calling upon Ugandans to reject the tax, the 5% tax on land and tenancy, not only land, tenancy, uh, uh, shares on the stock exchange. Is it in that stock exchange market? Look at it. How is it working? For the last four years, see what has been happening at the stock exchange market. It has not been flourishing. Now, for an economy to work, where you know stocks are working, go to Kenya, look at their stock exchange market. See how it is working. So for Uganda, if you want to grow your stock exchange market, and you're going to ask me, what is stock exchange? Of course, people who know trading will tell you about stocks. They will tell you if you are in bonds, how you're going to benefit from a bond. They will tell you that that is what is at the stock exchange market, but also the stock exchange market leaves out a big number of people. It can only afford people who have big incomes. If you have your 5 million, your 2 million, your 15 million, your 20 million, uh. even 100 million, you can't be on the stock exchange market. What are you doing there? They need people who have 150 billion. Those are the people. Those are the ones who can afford to be at the stock exchange market. 
But now I'm saying, even those ones are affected. So what do you have? Nothing. We have a drop from 163 to 3. To 6 or 3? To 6 uh. of those billionaires. So what urgently needs to be done, and government must now listen with their ears wide open, Circles are running on real ex, real, real estate, estate mm. business. And Sarah has pointed out and accurately, if they were to tax, they need to tax people who are in it for business. Don't tax people who are just having inherited property. They have nothing more to eat. And they are thinking... The only income I can get is if I sell this small plot of 50 by 100, get that money and put it in my business. It's now not going to work for you. That small plot of 50 by 100, you will pay tax on it. Mm. So if you had calculated that they've asked you for treatment in India of 90 million, you don't have where to get the money from. Your father had land and left it for you and you've decided now you're going to sell this land. As long as it is in the municipal or a city, you're going to pay this tax. Another thing that I found completely outrageous with this new budget regime is going to be that question of fuel. And I think Sarah elaborated it very well. She said, you see, if you increase the price on fuel, you've increased price across the board. And now we have this haphazard way of where taxis just increase prices how they want. And there's no rationale. The, everything in the marketplace, when you go to the market, they will tell you watermelon is now 30,000. Small watermelon like this is going to be 30,000. And 30,000 is what she has told you is the pension of an old man. So you're going to buy one piece of watermelon and walk home and eat it, then what? You can't even invest it anywhere. You can't put it in a shop. You can't say, I'm going to run this small retail shop where I'm going to put sugar, I'm going to put dry rations, and then at the end of the month, what I get from these dry rations is what all those shops are going to collapse. These Irish potatoes which you see on the street, they are selling, uh, you get two Irish potatoes for 2,000. Each Irish is going to be 1,000 shillings. This is what is coming because of that tax on fuel. Of course, government is saying, after one year, we shall have stabilized. And that money will go off. And that tax will go off. They also said the same thing. They have thing. already said that, but they keep increasing. They, they, they have also said the same thing. Hmm. And of course, the good thing is just to say what they have said. And then we remember to put them on spot for what hmm. they have said. But it's not going to work. The better thing is we have told them it's not going to work. We have explained we're going to end up buying one Irish potato at 1,000 shillings, for which the 1,000 shillings is also not there because you have nowhere you're earning it from. SMEs have closed. The shops which people always keep, those small retail shops, are going to close because they can't afford to transport produce from one place to another to be able to sell. So they are going to close. So now if you've closed, everything has closed, then what? What next? What will you tax? How will you increase that tax base which you're looking at? What actually needs to happen, and on a very, very urgent note, is one, downsize that tax or completely get rid of it. Two taxes I want government to consider to get rid of. One on the real estate and the one on fuel. Those two taxes, once eliminated, will help citizens to continue to try to recover after COVID-19. We've never had a comprehensive report on how many businesses survived COVID-19, how many new ones were created, how uh, money was spent during COVID-19. Parliament came, lied to us, had a miserable discussion around the issue. They dumped it. They came back with bills and they are every day passing bills, 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 like as if bills and laws is what they have to do only. Appropriation is no longer important to them. Accountability is not important to them. All that has to happen is a bill passing in parliament. No, parliament needs to go back on the drawing board. 
give us a true accountability of the recovery process of the economy for us to be able to understand how do we intervene as citizens, how do we benefit, where are we losing? Because the bigger bulk of Ugandans are still low income earners. Mm, doctor, let me come to you about the question examining the fiscal discipline and prudence of the government. Recently, the president came out to strongly warn against the creation of new political constituencies. In A the, little lately, though. In the budget proposals <laughs> uh, by the Electoral Commission, <laughs> there was that item, looks anticipatory. <clears throat> I don't know why they anticipate it, but they, they had some sort of exchange with the parliamentarians. The parliamentarians warned that uh, it is us that actually, you know, pass these constituencies. All that the Electoral Commission does is to conduct the elections, to have representatives. But let us look broadly at the cost of public administration in the country. Are really uh, the mega resources that we are collecting in terms of revenue uh, being spread out judiciously to some sort of sustain this whole state bureaucracy? Is it commensurate with, uh, first and foremost, the population that we have, but also the practical economic realities on the ground for the country? Can we sustain this? Well, when you look at the judiciary or fiscal discipline, let's look at the Ministry of Finance, because our taxes are in their hands. In the statement of account for the budget we are about to finish, the 2023-2024 budget, Parliament discovered that the Ministry of Finance spent 4.05 trillion illegally without the approval of Parliament. They extended their hand to the consolidated fund to touch taxpayers' money without any process. Mm. This was money spent above the budget outside passed the budget. and outside both the budget and the supplementary budget. Mm. 4.05 trillion without any process. Meaning that they have turned them, the consolidated fund into an ATM that they can rob any time they wish. So do we have any fiscal discipline to talk about? In the current budget, that budget estimates that are before Parliament for debate, on the floor of the House, the Minister of Finance announced a budget of 58.3 trillion. Yes. Uh. At closer scrutiny, the money is 60.68 trillion. trillion. Uh. Meaning that they are cooking figures and cooking and hiding figures in documents. There is no transparency. Uh. There is no transparency, there is no compliance by the Minister of Finance. So that puts zero mark on, on, on fiscal discipline by the technocrats at the Minister of Finance. Mm. Let's come to the size of government or the public expenditure bill. Mm. 559 MPs, I think, elected and the ex official. Mm. They have now gone 559. They were 527 when the election ended. Mm. They have now shot up. So meaning that for every 80,000 Ugandans, there is an MP. And how much money does an MP take? Minimum take home is 40 million. 50. Sorry. Minimum. Mm -hmm. 50 per month. That is Everyone. what... Everyone. That is what... That is what that MP told us. To... No, no the, the one who is the chief whip for, for FDC now. The in former Zimbabwe. head... In Zimbabwe. Uh. The former okay. head of market. So every MP takes a minimum <coughs> of 50 million per month home. How much money is that per year? Do we need an MP per 80,000 people? Do we need the current size of parliament? No. We need 150 MPs. Maybe we should merge them back to the traditional districts. Mm and make sure every district has only male and female mm. for gender parity. Mm. We don't need everybody in parliament. The second issue you need to look <coughs> at is presidential advisors. 135 now. 
every cabinet reshuffle there is an addition and for them they hold positions for life nobody's fired a vehicle <laughs> it's not a, yes <laughs> If you want a lifetime job, make sure you become a president advisor. Nobody will ever fire you until you die. You have fuel, no you have some command. No, nothing. Uh, yes. Uh, so nothing. No and they are never fired. <laughs> never. So for now, 40 years in power, President Seven has never fired. And of his president advisor. Acts. They only die. Yes. <laughs> a very cabinet reshuffle for you are two or three a day on the list. How many they now they? have officers, <laughs> <laughs> and the beauty of it is that they never advise him. How many, <laughs> how many are they, Sarah, right now, forgotten? <laughs> the of course, you lose the count. <laughs> the I don't know, but they've <laughs> all said they've how never many? met the man. How many? The so 135. Yeah. <laughs> they've never met him to advise him. All of them have said they let Nagenda or whoever. They've all said they've never met him Some to advise him. Some have complained him. that they actually have to endure his advice instead. Yeah. Mm. So that, 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 so it, those are people he just puts on the taxpayers' money to get some money just to be happy. Mm. Go to his uh, RDCs and deputies in each of the 132 districts. Mm. I hope they haven't expanded. There are 136 districts. Mm. So times two. That's the number of RDCs. A vehicle, a salary, the, 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 the fuel card, all of that on taxpayers' money. As we are holding this show, secondary school teachers, for the first time, are saying they've never, they've not been paid. Secondary school teachers on government payroll. Uh -huh. We are on the news, lunchtime news, that they've never been paid. Some are going through the second month now. Yes. Yeah. A government is failing on its statutory function to pay salary to public officials. As we go to our uh, budget, 30, 30, 24 to 25 trillion is put aside for debt repayment. Mm -hmm. That leaves us with about 34 trillion of the budget, meaning that we are soon going to be caught up in the debt trap whereby you are squeezing taxpayers to generate money just to pay debt, not to deliver service and grow the economy that you can tax into prosperity. So this is the cycle of trap people. And then you come to the presidency now. Remember, Office of the President has their own budget. But then you have State House with a $3 billion budget per day. Uh -huh. Parliament, on the other hand, with a $2.6 billion per day. We have seen the luxuries in Parliament. Anybody who wants now to have a good life really on, at the cost of a taxpayer should you go to Parliament. Should we to go to Parliament? Haven't we seen the evidence? So when you look at the really the future of the economy in this country, thanks to privatization, government does not do much in terms of input into the economy. The businesses are struggling on themselves. We have a few regime billionaires, those that can receive handouts, those that we are recently, you know, tabled requests in the parliament to get tax waivers. Uh. They are not more than 20 to 30. We have 20 to 30 regime billionaires that can freely raid the treasury, that can freely say, hey, I'm feeling not like paying tax, and then they have the waiver. But the rest of the Ugandans are struggling on themselves and holding this heavy, luxurious government on their heads. Very unfortunate. We cannot develop as a country. Joseph, I want us to interrogate the uh, rather strange phenomenon of the supplementary budget. Many of the ordinary citizens have not uh, really understood what this concept is all about. All they hear is that uh, sometime into the running of a new budget, there are requests uh, from different agencies of the government. Notorious is the presidents and the state house uh, who simply say, we need more money to do this. Some of the things they really want to do are not even, you know, clearly spelled out in the requests, the requisitions that they make. But we want to understand, is this a sustainable way of uh, processing the, the budget and ensuring that the budget realizes its principle 
objectives because if you fail to budget adequately and clearly it means that at a certain point you're either going to fall short and then you borrow like we've seen now they say they no longer want to borrow externally they want to borrow from within so Th that they, they no longer want or they've been banned no, that's what they said <laughs> officially. <laughs> that, <laughs> that they have put a stop to external borrowing. <laughs> so they want to utilize the resources that they have as a means, I think, of being frugal or something. <laughs> but uh, help us understand, what is this whole concept of the supplementary budget and can it be sustainable in the current budgetary concept? Yeah, at a basic level, Let's say you're a parent and you calculate that uh, a child needs, say, 2,000 every day for the entire term. And then um, 10 days after, they, they, they start calling you saying, uh, we need more money. Uh, what that could show is that either uh, the child has overspent uh, what you had given them, or they, in one way or the other, under budgeted. In our case as a government, and I think we should have this conversation at Focus on Parliament, we need to get last year's budget piece by piece compared with this year's budget. We get the ministerial statements for the budget estimates for the other year and this year. You will realize that there's a culture in Parliament where ministers just bring the very, very same thing and they put it on the table and they... Same amount. Sa same amount. They, they start from, this is the amount they gave us, it's just increased by like 2 billion now. Let's see how to press things together. If you read closely the Auditor General's report last year, it showed that government had supplemented expenditure for things that are very, very clear, like you couldn't miss out in the budget. Things like the non aligned Movement Summit. Things. And salaries. And, and salaries themselves, <laughs> you can imagine. Yeah, salaries. And they were Come in the supplementary that. budget. You can imagine, yeah? You can imagine. But also, um, so it, it shows that we are, we are a very unserious country to the extent that we can budget for things which they are clearly inside. You wait for, I think AFCON is, uh, the Africa Cup of Nations is coming up. 26. You see that very, yeah, around a few months too. We sh that's when we'll be putting flowers around Nambore. Perhaps we'll perhaps <laughs> have borrowed some, uh, some two billion to ensure. And the ones of uh, Nambore that. <laughs> the uh, planted trees. Uh, <laughs> I still don't compare it, but, but that is besides the point. The second thing is on, is on the ban rate for the money which is even given to local governments and, and the MDAs themselves. You will realize that uh, part of what is increasing the trend of supplementary budgets is that the Ministry of Finance sends money to local governments and they cannot burn this money off, even for projects that are clear. Say they are building a road, they send you money, you can't spend it, it bounces back. And for that money to get back to you, it has to be appropriated again. Mm -hmm. So there is, there is just a general problem with, with how we govern this country to the extent that we borrowed money and that money was not even spent, yet it was accumulating interest. Mm. After that money is given to people at the local government, they cannot burn that money. And you will find it is for easy things like procuring boreholes, for having a road contractor to fix a road, for doing basic things. It's just a general, a general laxity. You find people who get into office, they have roles. They get into office, they put their jacket there, and they move to their business. Because there's just a general laxity with, with how people are using the taxpayers' money. In fact, when someone says, I got a job with government, most people say, ah, you, you have arrived, you have arrived. Because they know there's so much laxity, there is no supervision at all. People, they, they, they believe you've arrived in a place where you're going to have a permanent and pensionable job, yet you are delivering the very bare minimum. So uh, as and to when we realize that we have a problem with how we are managing uh, the money which people are fighting for. Remember, almost 35 to 40% to of your resources as a citizen, the government is taking it off uh, every month. You're earning 1.5, you know that that money is going to go off. 
But the people who are taking that money, they come into office, they work three to four hours a day, they disappear. That money is being used to buy political opponents, is used for political patronage. It's high time we ask these questions to our readers. What is the money we are paying you doing? The trend is not sustainable. It cannot be sustainable, but how will it end? Citizens must actively, daily, make sure these politicians don't get sleep on Twitter, anywhere, make phone calls, go to their homes, have placards where possible, paint their compounds with these statements of stop misusing money which we are fighting for. We must get serious or else we, we, we don't have a future. We clearly don't. Yeah. If we don't rise up as a citizen. Charity, I think uh, Joseph makes a fundamental point by asking what's the accountability for the money that we are spending on all these things and all these people. But in Parliament, we have, uh, so to say, the chief budgeting device or instrument of the state with also a double responsibility of uh, helping us, the ordinary citizens, to demand for accountability for these expenditures and the resources. But recently, Parliament has also projected itself as being complicit in schemes to actually steal from the taxpayer. They are not accountable, number one. Number two, the level of corruption there is now notorious to the extent that citizens feel very disillusioned. There is nothing they can really do about it. Despite, uh, you know, all the noise, the whole about on social media, the president has come out strongly to defend the speaker and say, no, 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 this shouldn't be <laughs> your business. She's doing very good. So going forward, what does the ordinary citizen uh, have got to do? Because the Office of the Auditor General, which is also the other uh, really accounting device of the state, is also, uh, you know, it is answerable to the parliament. So what's the way forward? How can we get out of this? Is it a failure of the law? Do we amend the law? Do we press harder as citizens? There is no gap in the law. And there is no gap in uh, the institutions that are required to fight corruption. The only thing is what the IGG said. I have a chair. But this chair has no power. <laughs> <laughs> she said. But did she say that? Wait, where's yes. the power? <laughs> she said that. With have someone. A, have a chair. chair? Mm. Yes, madam. But this chair has no power. Because when I look for accountability, it's not the, 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 the accusations. But once I want to take action, there is no evidence. So she said, everything is hearsay. It amounts to hearsay. And then she said, but we are going to go ahead with the lifestyle audit. We are going to start now by asking lower cadre civil servants hmm. to blow a whistle on their bosses. We're going to host them in state house. In state house? Hey. And she called them there. They went. They had tea, they had conversations, they said nothing. <laughs> so why is that? When was this? <laughs> yes, but, but who can you <laughs> Excuse me, people. And to be so dramatic. Of, Wait, the Mr. choice Mr. of the of the meeting is very interesting. <laughs> was the president a participant in the meeting? Wait, Mr. He was not. The, he was not. It yeah. is the IGG. Who called? But why state house? In the president's state office. House no, actually, not state president's office. But Sorry. there are also cameras. So how can somebody at the president's office not the state house? Whatever. Make at the, the president mm. before at the president's cameras. office, not state house, but president's office. It's still interesting. The but to the venue. yes, the venue. Now, when she came out, this is what she said. She said, the lower cadres have feared to talk <laughs> because they are accomplices. And they need, they need the favors from their bosses. You people, we are on our own. Exactly. That's because why I, uh, I have burst I, out I, and laughed 
until yes. the cough came. <laughs> yes, but as you take a, a breather, if if you look at it, <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing at the IGG because as much as she means well, <clears throat> the implementation is haphazard. How do you take people in these offices that have cameras <coughs> and you expect them <laughs> and they are lower cadres and bugged. you expect <laughs> them to blow a whistle about their bosses? This is something that you should not even announce if you are serious about it. It's so you come on. Because how do you make an announcement? <laughs> when anyone else would say, okay, who has gone for this meeting? Exactly. <laughs> Let me wait it was on the media. Out, and I will deal with all of you. But how was the selection <laughs> process done to <laughs> Thank yeah, you, we my joke to too identify much. the, yeah, the, we the, too much. the <laughs> selection process to identify the participants of the meeting? You, you no, the they went to the ministries mm -hmm. and every ministry they picked a T-girl. They picked the lower cadres, they picked Who the picked secretary, them? the IGG, the but office of the had been, had been picked. Yes. So every office but knew she had picked yeah, them and weird taken weird. them to the president's <laughs> office <laughs> to have conversation <laughs> about their bosses mm. and to know... No, I think she's and taking to, a citizen's fair right. And to get to understand how this corruption <laughs> is actually carried mm. out in these offices. Of course, Sarah. This is what I am telling you. She said, I have a chair, but it has what? No power. But now she has mm. become dramatic. Madam IGG, you're my friend. <laughs> but please. <laughs> yes, she has become serious. Uh, 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 the reason she has become dramatic uh, is because also corruption in Uganda is almost now a drama. We are in theatre. Every day you are entertained to a new theatrical. At the end of the day. Happens. Yeah, at the end of the day, no accountability actually takes place. That is the stark reality. And so if you think you're going to do anything, I wonder then where do you start? But that is what happened just two, three days ago. Today is when she came out finally to tell us that those people have refused to talk. <laughs> but is she surprised that they refused to talk? Charito, what's the remedy for the citizen? <laughs> because parliament is complicit now, now or rather overtly and notoriously in uh, the scheme to steal from the taxpayer. I had the leader of opposition, Joel, and he has continued to sing. Also, him is now just in a drama. <laughs> it's also theatric. <laughs> he said, I want the DPP to move into parliament and investigate. But DPP, DPP. is not an investigator. Uh, yes. He said he wants DPP. Mm -hmm. He wants IGG. And he wants who was else? The police. DPP is a prosecutor. He talked about DPP, IGG, mm. police. And really? another institute. DPP. Then DPP he, is he also said yes, he yes. wants but he the talk police. about DPP. Yes. He said he also wants the Attorney General. He talked about the DPP. Joel talked about the DPP. But if you look at the way the DPP works, DPP which is works now where on we come. Police investigations. Yes, yes. Exactly. Mm. And for them to open that file, it must come from somewhere. Somebody must be instructed. Originated. They are not yes. investigators. Exactly. So for us to be able to understand that as citizens, that's where we need to start. We need to start at the question of civic and voter education. So every time we see these things, oh no, the DPP has a file and is going to drop. See, when the Mabati saga came up, DPP had so many files that were opened. Some were closed, some were... Police so, or DPP? DPP got files for... From this, police. From, from police, police, yes. For action. They were supposed to investigate. Mm. But those files, the, the, the charges were dropped for most of the files. Citing oh. insufficient evidence. Exactly. Mm. So I think the start point for citizens is the question of civic education. We have sung this one, even courts came out and said, you know, we need citizens to be more enlightened such that they demand more and there's a bigger mass of citizens that will be understanding why they demand for the things that they demand. But civic education has been frustrated by government still. And that's why I said we are in a theatre and we should just enjoy being on the movie scene and know that, yeah, there is corruption, it is here, it is existent, and nothing much is going to come from the other end. But I want to make a call to government. 
there are things they have promised, like tourism, okay? And they said if you grow tourism, you'll be able to have an effect on increasing incomes, even for ordinary Ugandans. We've not seen that happening. Can they give us accountability? Okay, Parliament, they have eaten what they have eaten, the loot they have, they are happy, they have been even uh, covered up by the executive. But can they now go back to the basic? Can they cross-check with tourism? What is happening there? When we rejected Pineti, okay, and then Pineti took a stall, what happened to the coffee? How many farmers are now into this coffee thing, how much she is was being given to. Uh, how much is being packaged <laughs> tea. as a substitute? <laughs> Pinete attended a, a tea <laughs> growers meeting in my district with the prime minister. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, yeah, yes. but that's what I said. We are in a theater. <laughs> um, even me, I didn't <laughs> know that P Pinetti now has tea. I actually didn't know that she moved from coffee to tea. Yes, Congratulations. Oh, oh it's a dice. <laughs> There is uh, diversification strategy. I don't know. <laughs> but now that's where Parliament needs to move to. If they've, if they've had a self-aggrandizement uh, 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 schedule, they've eaten this money, can they try and focus on a few areas that will gain the ordinary citizen? One of them being tourism. How do we grow tourism? How do we have this thing turning into an income-generating uh, entity for Uganda? And uh, eventually, what is it that we have as a country that we can sell to the outside world? If you see how Tanzania has transformed itself, they've told you, Sarah told you, it was infrastructure. They, they swallowed a bullet. They put up speed trains. They improved their road infrastructure. Now you don't spend time in those dollar dollars how it was before. You were jumping in and out of a dollar and it was packed. No, you're now sitting comfortably. In fact, if we talk about them, it's a story of the past. Somebody will think, where are you coming from to even talk about them? But in Uganda, that's what you have. You just go here to the Northern Bypass when you're coming from Mbarra, jump off from Busega and take a, 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 a taxi which is going to bring you here to Untinda. See the quality of taxi you'll move in. It may not even get you where you're going. Charitas, even you share your closing remarks on the program. So my, my, my parting <coughs> shots is um, we have the Auditor General's report. And for me, in my view, the Auditor General remains the only office that is authentic and has authentic documentation to do with the problem of corruption as we have it in Uganda and to do with the problem of budgeting for flimsy uh, uh, um, flimsy issues than what benefits us. Let's go back and study the Auditor General's report as Parliament and come out with the issues that will improve the livelihood of ordinary citizens. I think that will help to solve a bit of the selfishness. Take the money, but give us back a benefit of you've studied the Auditor General's reports, we can Focus here, we can focus there. Thank you, Charity, for sharing your views with us on the topic. Mr. Joseph, your closing remarks on the program. Uh, thank you. Uh, dear Ugandan, I, I understand perhaps you have not been concerned about your country because, I mean, why should you? But I think you need to remember that for every good you buy from a shop, you are giving money to the government. For every salary you receive, you are giving more than 35% to the government. For every land you are going to sell, you'll be giving money to the government. If you're constructing a house of 100 million, let's say you use 200 bags, okay, not 200, let's say like uh, 300 bags of cement, it means you'll be paying the government more millions of money per construction. You can no longer remain unconcerned about what is happening. You need to start asking for accountability for this money which you are paying. Because every week you are going to work, almost one and a half days you are working for the government. 
because the money you earn in that one and a half days or even more, depending on how much you earn, will be going back into the hands of people that are squandering it. I interest you to be concerned in this state called Uganda because if this state does not work, it means your children will suffer, your children's children will suffer. We have seen countries where citizens are not concerned. They don't want to hold their citizens, their leaders to account. They just lead us to just go there and eat. These states have failed. They have failed and we have seen them. There is no state under the sun that has survived for citizens who don't rise up and hold their leaders to accounts to ensure that whatever they do, they are doing it in the interest of the people. I hope you really get concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, for your views on the topic and also for your patriotic guidance to the citizens. Doctor, your closing remarks on the program. The quality of democracy in this country will continue to determine the quality of economy and the quality of lives of Ugandans. Bank of Uganda has said that 1% of Ugandans earn 1 million and above. That is slightly below $300. It's about $250. I want to compare Uganda with a new democratic <coughs> kid under broke, Senegal. Senegal has experienced peaceful transitions of power since independence. The average income of the working people in Senegal is $570. This is above $2 million. And this is the average income of working Senegalese people. Whereas in Uganda, the average income for 1% of our population is $250. It's half of less than half of what an average Senegalese has. We have a stagnant democracy with a life president, 40 years, going back, going on with the slogan of Tovak Main. So long as we continue with these slogans of no change, Tovak Main, I am here until death do me apart, we shall continue to suffer as ordinary Ugandans in poverty and we shall continue to decline in terms of revenues and performance of our economy, whereas the only growth is going to be corruption, the only growth is going to be public debt, we are above one trillion, please wake up. Mm. You emphasize new thinking for the country and the leadership. But let me appreciate you, Dr. <laughs> Joseph and Charity, for your able participation on the program with regards to our topic today, which was a discussion on the general state of the economy, but specifically emphasizing the tax regime and also the new budget estimates for the financial year 2024-2025. And to our viewers, we appreciate you once again for keeping us company. From the start up to the conclusion of this program, many thanks to the production unit for keeping us live on air. And please engage us on our various social media platforms. We are on X, we are on Facebook, we are on YouTube. Subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can also watch this program. This has been the Focus on Parliament show on Civic Space TV. See you next time.